पृथ्वी शांतिरंतरिक्षकम शांतिर द्यव शांतिर दिशा शांतिरवांतर दिशा शांतिरग्निशांतिर वायु शांतिरादित्य शांतिश चंद्रमा शांतिर नक्षत्राणि शांतिराप शांतिरोषदय शांतिर वनस्पतय शांतिर गौ शांतिरजा शांतिरश्व शांति पुरुष शांतिर ब्रह्म शांतिर ब्राह्मण शांति शांतिरेव शांति शांतिर मे अस्तु शांति ही मे दे बी पीस ऑन अर्थ एंड इन द स्काय मे दे बी पीस इन द वॉटर एंड इन ऑल डिरेक्शन्स मे दे बी पीस इन द प्लांट्स इन द ट्रीज एंड इन एनिमल्स मे दे बी पीस इन द हार्ट्स ऑफ ऑल बीइंग्स May there be peace in everyone and in everything. Sarve tra sukhina santu, sarve santu niramaya ha, sarve bhadrani pasyanto, ma kashchit dukha bhag bhavet, sarvas taratu durgani, sarvo bhadrani pasyato. सर्वसद्बुद्धिमापनोतु सर्वसर्वत्र नंदतु मे ऑल बी हैप्पी एंड हेल्थी मे ऑल सी व्हाट इज गुड एंड मे नो वन एक्सपीरियंस मिसरी मे ऑल ओवरकम देयर ऑब्स्टिकल्स एंड अक्वायर गुड टेंडेंसीज मे पीपल एवरीवेयर फाइंड जॉय एंड फुलफिलमेंट Let us now spend some time touching the center of peace and joy in our hearts. A good way to begin the practice is to withdraw the scattered energies of the mind and bring them to rest on one point. That point can be our own breathing. Let us therefore practice breathing with awareness. As we breathe in, let us visualize that our body and mind are being filled with love strength and compassion and as we breathe out let us release all the stress anxiety and exhaustion in the body and mind let us practice this way for a while Let us now turn our attention to the region of our heart. Although God is present everywhere and in everyone, the divine presence can be felt most clearly in our own hearts. We can meditate in any way we have been taught. To remain focused, we can take the help of a short mental prayer or a mantra or a divine name. Let us now spend some time dwelling on the presence of god in our hearts
असतोमा सत्कमय तमसोमा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्योर्मा अमृत गमय आविरावीर्मे थी रुद्रयत्ते दक्षिण मुखम तेन मं पाहि नि May the divine lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May the divine consciousness fill our hearts and protect us. so we are studying the the layers over the self what is the book describes as the not self anatma and primarily there are three layers over the atma the outermost layer which we have studied is the gross body sthula sharira the inner layer which is subtle sukshma is the subtle body sukshma sharira and we saw that in the last few weeks as well today we begin the study of the innermost layer which is called karana sharira karana means cause and that is why this innermost layer is called the causal body so let's begin verse 108 अव्यक्तनामनी परमेश शक्ति अनाद्य विद्यात्मिका परा कार्यानुमेया सुधिय माया यया जगत्सर्वद प्रसूयते माया और इग्नोरेंस नोन एज द अनमैनिफेस्ट अव्यक्त is the power of the supreme ruler she is without beginning anadi superior as causes to effects and consists of the three gunas a person of clear intellect can know her existence only through its effects it is from her that this whole universe has emerged in vedantic understanding of life's goal and purpose <clears throat> the main obstacle to understanding our true nature is maya the maya is a word that gets that appears very often in vedantic books and understanding and it's very important to understand the meaning of maya correctly because because the word is used quite often it often also gets misused and uh, understood in a wrong way and therefore understanding of maya is important it's if that's the major obstacle then we need to understand that obstacle well as they say even in war time if you want to defeat the enemy you need to know the enemy well know what the enemy's weaknesses are and then you can conquer the enemy so if maya is the major obstacle we need to understand maya well so that it will become easier to get it out of our way so maya is really a word for ignorance etymologically sometimes they say maya ya that which is ma which is not there so literally if you look at the word maya it means that which is not there and yet it appears to be there and and later on we will see why maya is called maya 
and because the word maya in sanskrit is a feminine gender therefore maya is referred to as she really there is no no gender but in in many indian languages and clearly in sanskrit as well every object has a gender irrespective of whether the object is living or non living and so maya grammatically is a feminine gender and that's why you find it she is being referred to as a she maya ignorant is known as the unmanifest unmanifest the word is avyakta vyakta means manifest avyakta means not manifest in other words maya is even more subtle than the subtle body now the sukshma sharira itself cannot be seen and so maya is the cause of even that so it is even subtler than the subtlest thing that we have known and that is why it is the unmanifest maya is also the power of the supreme ruler paramesha shakti hi parama means supreme isha means ruler that's why you find in books the word ishvara ishvara means the ruler so paramesh paramesha or parameshwara means the supreme ruler now why does the supreme being need a power and for the simple reason that without power even a supreme being cannot produce anything we know that in order to do anything at all power is necessary without that nothing can be done and so even if god has to create this world create this universe god needs power and so that power of god the power of the supreme being is called maya we might say why god why can't god just create the world why bring in the power in the as a kind of a, as a intermediate entity and the reason is that if the world is an effect then the effect must have a cause god cannot be the cause of the world and if you kind of it's a more kind of a little technical matter and that is the world is perishable the world oh, it's perishable now the cause if god were the direct cause of the world then there are actually several problems but the first problem would be how come an imperishable cause produce a perishable effect it doesn't work because the cause and effect there has to be a relationship between a cause and effect and there is a long discussion in these books about what is the relationship between cause and effect what makes something a cause in fact one of the schools of thought leads to the conclusion there is no such thing as a cause effect uh, i won't bore you with the technicalities but except just to just to point out some of the main points so when you say this is the cause and this is the effect the question that gets asked is is the effect same as the cause or different from the cause if you say is the same as the cause then you say then why call it the effect they are just same if you say they are different from each other then they would say well if they are different then what makes this the cause anything different from it could be the cause so they kind of go into lot of these kind of um technical questions and then one of the conclusion that is reached is what we call effect is only the cause in a different form so if this world is an effect of god this world would be god in a different form 
if God were to be in one form at some time, and then after the world is created, God becomes a different form, then God becomes changeable. If God is changeable, then God becomes perishable also. Anything that is prone to change cannot be eternal. So this is the main problem why God cannot be the direct cause of this universe. And that's why you have this intermediate power of God which directly is responsible for the world. And that's why it's called the power of the supreme ruler. She is without beginning. Now, this is another adjective that will often get used to Maya, without beginning. We could still ask, is Maya really without beginning? And the answer is, no, it's not really without beginning, but without be <laughs> let me put it this way. Suppose now, uh, okay, let, let me first put it this way. Why, what's the problem with Maya being without beginning? And the answer is, if something is without beginning, it will be without end. That You'll, some of you will remember the second chapter of the Gita in which Krishna also points this out. That when there is birth, there is death. If there is a beginning, then there is an end. If there is to be no end, then there should be no beginning as well. And therefore, Maya, if it is really without beginning, then it will be without end. If it is without end, the obstacle will never go away. So we know that Maya does end. And because Maya ends, we have to assume that it began at some point. But we don't know when it began. So only in a relative sort of way, the expression is Maya is without beginning. It's, think about it. I mean, if Maya is ignorance, this is true with regard to all forms of ignorance. Now, let's say I don't know Japanese. Wait, not let's say, I don't know Japanese. Now, if someone were to ask me, when did your ignorance of the Japanese language start? I have no answer to that. I would say, well, it's always been there. And that's why I can say my ignorance of Japanese is without beginning. But I cannot say it without end. Tomorrow, if I decide to learn the language, maybe go and uh, take a few classes, read some books, my ignorance of Japanese can go. So it can end. So all forms of ignorance are like that. That we don't know when that ignorance began, but they can end. And that's why, in that sense, Maya is called without beginning. Superior. Why is Maya superior? Because generally we see that the cause is always considered superior to the effect. Because if the cause were not there, then the effect wouldn't come. And consists of the three gunas. And the later verses now will describe what role those gunas play. It is from her that the whole universe has emerged. Idam Sarvam Jagat, this whole universe. Now being the cause of this whole universe, Maya is the causal body. So just to summarize, the gross body, the outermost layer is this physical body that we have. The Sukshma Sharira, the subtle body is Man, Buddhi, Ahankar, the mind, intellect, ego, emotions, feelings, memories, all those things is the subtle body. Behind this is the causal body, which is nothing but Maya. And within them all is the Atman, the real self. So that's who we are at present. The Atma with these three layers. Verse 109. 
ಸನ್ನಾಪಿ ಸನ್ನಾಪ್ಯುಭಯಾತ್ಮಿಕಾನೋ ಭಿನ್ನಾಪ್ಯ ಭಿನ್ನಾಪ್ಯುಭಯಾತ್ಮಿಕಾನೋ ಸಾಂಗಾಪ್ಯ ನಂಗಾಹ್ಯುಭಯಾತ್ಮಿಕಾನೋ ಮಹಾದ್ಭುತ ಅನಿರ್ವಚನೀಯ ರೂಪ ಶಿ ಇಸ್ ನೀದರ್ ರಿಯಲ್ ನಾರ್ ಅನ್ರಿಯಲ್ ನಾರ್ ಬೋತ್ ನೀದರ್ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ಫ್ರಾಮ್ ನಾ ದ ಸೇಮ್ ಆಸ್ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮನ್ ನಾರ್ ಬೋತ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ನೀದರ್ ಕಂಪೋಸ್ಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಪಾರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ನಾರ್ ವಿದೌಟ್ ಪಾರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ನಾರ್ ಬೋತ್ ಶಿ ಇಸ್ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಅಮೇಝಿಂಗ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕ್ರೈಬಬಲ್ so this is who maya is and that that's we understand what the problem is it's very difficult to say anything about maya she is neither real nor unreal the word for real in sanskrit is sat the word for unreal is asat you cannot say okay and there is one thing i have mentioned earlier also that if something is real it is eternal there is no such thing as a temporary reality well if so, you know it's like this if something is only temporarily real we don't consider it real night times when we dream the dream world as long as we are seeing the dream is real but it's only temporarily real when we wake up in the morning it vanishes and then we have no difficulty in saying oh the dream was unreal because it is only temporary but we cannot easily dismiss this waking experience because day after day after day month after month year after year this thing seems to continue and therefore we say the waking world is real as opposed to the dream world which is just a free entertainment every night so no such thing as a temporary reality so we cannot say maya is real because if maya were real then maya would be eternal and if it is eternal it would never go but you cannot even say maya is unreal because we are experiencing it so that's the problem with every kind of misperception you cannot say it's real you it's i mean go back to the classical example often given in vedanta about the rope and the snake a rope in a semi room mistaken for a snake now when you see the snake the same question can be asked is the snake real or unreal and we say well we cannot say the snake is real because when you switch on the light you see it was only a rope but you cannot say the snake is unreal either if it is unreal how are you seeing it so i'm not seeing a snake here now but i see a snake that time when i enter a room with a coiled rope and an insufficient light so even that snake which is superimposed on the rope you cannot say it's real you cannot say it's unreal and therefore in vedanta they sometimes speak about a third category and they call it mithya mithya means that which is unreal but which appears to be real so there are these three categories real sat which means only god a brahman then asat unreal now an example of unreal in if you see all these books because these books are several centuries old they often give the example of they call it shasha vishana in sanskrit which means uh, a rabbit with a horn now you can say a rabbit with a horn is unreal today we cannot so much say that now with all these things in genetics people probably might be able to grow a horn on a rabbit so that example is no longer valid but a good example for an unreal entity would be say a square circle no one has ever seen a square circle and therefore we can say a square circle is unreal so one end god or brahman with 
who is real, the ultimate one reality. On the other end is this unreal entity which no one has ever seen in the past, present or future. Now, in between are a lot of things. In fact, everything else which is unreal but appears to be real. And that's why it's called Mithya. So, Maya, you cannot say it's real, you cannot say it's unreal. So you can say, Maya is Mithya. This world, you cannot say it's real because it vanishes. If, it, if, it were, if the world were real, it should never vanish. But when we go to sleep, the world vanishes. Just like the dream vanishes when I wake up, the world vanishes when I go to sleep. So really there is not, I mean, we, the distinction we sometimes make between dream and waking, we can question that because the dream starts when I sleep and ends when I wake up. This world starts when I wake up and ends when I sleep. And therefore the world cannot be said to be real. But you cannot say it's unreal either because we are experiencing it. We are living our entire lives in it. So it's neither real nor unreal. And so this we could say it's mithya. So that's why if you look at this description here, maya is neither real nor unreal nor both. Now nothing can be real and unreal at the same time. And therefore, so neither different from nor the same as Brahman. Now, why is Maya not the same as Brahman? Well, if the Maya were same, then Maya would be also eternal, like Brahman, and Maya wouldn't go. If Maya were different from Brahman, then we have two things then. There is Brahman and there is Maya. Then your oneness is affected. And therefore, you cannot say Maya is one with Brahman or even different from Brahman. What it's ultimately going to end up with, you cannot say anything about Maya. No matter what you say, you're going to be inaccurate. Similarly, you cannot say Maya is composed of parts or without parts. Now, if Maya is composed of parts, now get this, every object that is composed of parts has a beginning. In fact, birth really means different parts coming together, not just of a living entities. Even a chair or a table, you have these different parts, the carpenter comes and puts them together, and that's the birth of a table or a chair. Same thing with regard to living creatures as well. So, you cannot say Maya has parts, because then Maya would have a beginning. But we say Maya doesn't have a beginning. On the other hand, you cannot say Maya does not have parts. Because if it doesn't have parts, then it is immortal. Because destruction or death really means the parts which are held together become separated again. That's why I speak about dust returning to dust. That's why when uh, people die, what remains ultimately just a heap of ashes or a heap of dust. And so you cannot say Maya has parts or doesn't have parts. You cannot say Maya is one with Brahman or different from Brahman. You cannot say Maya is real or unreal. You cannot say Maya is both either. And therefore, she is most amazing and indescribable. Hence we find the, the struggle to express what Maya is through language. And that's why we can only speak about Maya in negative terms. Maya is not this, not this. You cannot say this, you cannot say that, and so on. Next verse. Shuddha dvaya brahma vibodhana shyap sarpa brahmo rajju vivekato yatha rajas tamas sattva miti prasiddha just as the delusion of a snake vanishes when the rope is discerned, so does Maya vanish 
when the pure non-dual Brahman is directly experienced. Maya attributes, guna, rajas, tamas and sattva are well known through their effects. We have already referred to the illustration of the rope and snake. So when we mistake a rope for a snake, what we are really doing is, we are, the word that is gets used in Sanskrit is called adhyasa or adhyaropa, which really means you are superimposing a false entity, snake, on a real entity rope. So when I mistake a rope for a snake, the snake is as if covering the rope. So rope here in that example is called adhishthana in Sanskrit or substratum. Snake, which is superimposed on it, is that which is it's called um, an object that is superimposed, the layer covering the rope, you could say. So when I know the substratum rope, then the false snake vanishes. And that happens when I switch on the light, and darkness goes away, the false snake disappears and I see the rope. Now applying that same example, the substratum, the Adishthana here is this infinite non-dual Brahman. So in place of the rope is Brahman. Now on that rope, the darkness is the darkness of Maya. And then this body-mind or Maya first of all, which is the causal body, is superimposed on Brahman. And then through Maya, is the primal cause, then there is Sukshma Sharira, Sthula Sharira, and this whole Virat Sharira, the whole world also emerges from it. So these are the different layers that get put on Brahman. And so just as when we look, see the rope, the snake vanishes, when we recognize that I am this infinite being, then this maya will vanish along with its effects. In other words, for every one of us, our present identity that I am a human being. Now what, 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 does being, what does human being a human being mean? A dog would probably have an identity, I am a dog. Um, we are saying we are human beings because, well, we have a body which we, we have categorized under this human being category. So our body, our mind, everything that we think about ourselves answers the description of a human being, which includes mortality. We were born at some point, we'll die someplace, which includes the vulnerability of the body, the body is fragile, the body can fall sick and to prevent that sickness we are all wearing all this now. Um, the body ages, so all the changes that occur in the body, the illnesses that can occur, death that can occur, all of these things are my present identity. My substratum is Brahman. On it, this snake has appeared. So, so here is one important thing to recognize. And this is something often a mistake that is very commonly made by most Vedanta students. When we look at that rope snake analogy, people immediately apply to the world and say, just as the snake is not real, the world is not real. But that's not how it was intended. That, that analogy is not intended to show the unreality of the world. Because in that rope snake analogy, we are a neutral observer. 
looking at the rope and snake. We are neither the rope nor the snake. But then you cannot apply that example to the world because we are not neutral observers of the world. We are in the world. We are part of the world. And therefore, if you want to learn from that rope snake analogy, you have to do it in a slightly different way. Because we are in the world and part of the world, to understand that example, we have to be inside the rope. We have to be the rope. Now, you say, well, how can we be a rope? So think that you are acting in a Disney movie. And you know, you know, in Disney, Walt Disney movies, it's possible. Everything moves, everyone talks. Nothing is, seems to be impossible in, in Disney pictures. So now think that you are the rope. And the darkness here is not outside you, it's inside you. It's the darkness of ignorance. And because of that darkness, you have forgotten you are the rope. And it's not just you have forgotten you are the rope. You are seeing yourself as a snake. So that's the problem. So it's not that the world is real or unreal. That's not the point at all. In fact, it's impossible to prove one way or the other, whether the world is real or unreal. But the, the prime concern is what is my identity? My present identity is I'm a human being. But is that my real identity? Or I'm a rope thinking I'm the snake. In other words, my real identity is this, I'm this infinite being, pure and perfect. But because of this inner darkness of ignorance, I have forgotten I'm this infinite being. And in place of that, this false snake, this false mortal human identity has come upon me. So I'm not a human being trying to be, become divine. I'm a divine being who is deluded into thinking I'm human. What it means is this. I cannot be divine until I stop being human. I cannot be immortal until I give up my identity of a mortal creature. So the more we cling to our own form, we will never know that in reality we are formless. The more I cling to my own limited identity, I will never realize that I'm truly an infinite being. And hence, the need for discernment. And that's the primary focus of this book. Viveka means looking deeply. That's also the title of the book that you have. If I look deeply, I will see that my present understanding that I'm just this human being is not right. If I look superficially, yes, I'm a human being. But if I look deeply, questions begin to arise. And then with detachment and practicing, remember those four primary practices described in the first section of the book, Viveka, Vairagya, those quality necessary, the longing for freedom, if we develop those essential qualities, we will acquire a clarity of vision. And when vision becomes clear, then we'll begin to see things more clearly. It's then that we will realize that these upper layers of the maya, of the sukshma sharira, the sthula sharira, all this will go away, and then 
I will know truly who I am. And that is enlightenment. So that's essentially the goal of this entire study. Not merely to feel intellectually stimulated, but, but to see whether it can truly transform me. So that at the, the root cause of all kind of stress and anxiety and worry and fear and every kind of limitation we, any of us might experience, if you go to the root cause of it, that is Maya. So unless and until Maya gets out of the way, we won't know the truth. That's the idea. So we'll stop here today. Going forward, we will see that these three attributes that are mentioned here of Rajas, Tamas and Sattva, what role they play, what are their functions, how they operate in our lives, all this will be discussed in the subsequent verses. So if you have any thoughts, ideas, questions, comments, feel free to ask. Hari Om Swamiji. Hmm. So, is it um, is it correct, Swamiji, that whatever that is not real or unreal is mithya, and also is Maya? So, Maya is mithya. Yes, Maya is mithya, and Maya is the root cause of everything else. So Maya is the mother of all other mithya things that we experience in life. So do we say that the sukshma and the stula sharira are also Maya? Yes, they are the effects of Maya. Effects of Maya. Yeah. Because the Maya is the subtlest of all. And then compared to Maya then, it's from the subtle that the gross universe comes. So Maya is the subtlest of all. And from then, this whole universe evolves from Maya. So, Swamiji, is there different levels of unreal? Good question. Yep. Um, yes, unreal is unreal, but but human mind being what it is, we want to categorize and make things, and sometimes that can help in in uh, our understanding. So you could say that reality has levels, or it's possible to look at reality as if it has levels. And in some ways we are already doing it, not always in a very philosophical way, but as I just mentioned earlier, we do say that the waking experience is more real than the dream experience. So we are already saying that this is more real than that. What's interesting about that is, I can say that waking is more real than dream only when I'm awake, not when I'm dreaming. Because in the dream, I don't know a dream is a dream. In the dream, that's very real to me. But when I wake up, and compare the two experiences, then I say, no, no, this is more real than that. If we accept this gradation of reality, that the waking is more real than the dream, then to be just logical about it, we have to accept the possibility that something could be more real than this waking experience. Just as when I wake up, the dream which appeared to be real no longer appears to be real. When I wake up from this experience, the waking experience, which is what really Samadhi is, which is what really the experience of God is. So when I encounter a reality which is higher than the waking, 
then from the standpoint of that experience, even this would appear to be a dream. So just as when I wake up, I dismiss my nightly experience as dream, when samadhi, I can dismiss this also as dream. So yes, in that way, you could speak about levels of reality. I'm a little confused here, like, you said Brahman and Maya are not different and also it can not be separate. But in the Gospel, Thakur says, Brahma Shakti Abhed. Mm -hmm. So how, how can we reconcile? In the sense that they are not, they are not different, but they, they are not like two different entities. But they are not one either. I mean, that, that's the whole point, that you cannot say they are one or cannot. It's, and Thakur himself gives the example. He says, just as milk and his whiteness, so the white color of the milk. Now you say, is the white color same as the milk? No. A white color is a white color. Milk is milk. But you cannot separate them two. So it's in that sense the two are not different. Anything else? Yep. So you have a follow-up to the previous question. Mm -hmm. um, so when we talk about sukshma, sukshma sharira or uh, stula sharira, um, is sukshma sharira more, I don't know whether to use the word real, but how do we, so you, you mentioned higher and lower, when, you know, samadhi is a higher level. How do we, why do we may say that samadhi is a higher level? Is it because, yeah, I don't know why we say samadhi is a higher level, because is, it, is, is the truth more apparent from that reality? Or, so if you go from dream, mm -hmm. waking state to samadhi, each, in each state, I am seeing this as real meaning there is no mm -hmm, other state. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what is reality to me in that state. Right, right. But yet we say waking, as you said, waking state is more real in a sense than the dream state, and samadhi is more real than the waking state. Mm -hmm. Why do we say that? Is it because... Well, right now you tell me, why do you say that waking is more real than dream, or do you think they are not different? The only thing I can think of, Swamiji, is that it's more long-lived, that it comes back again and again. Exactly. So when you enter into Samadhi, you will see that that is even more long-lived. You will have the feeling this is even more long-lived than this. So it's the time, it's the, it's, it's, it's time Yeah, I mean, really there are no, the thing is this, you are already assuming that there are levels of reality. Mm. If you are assuming there are levels of reality, then also assume that time is a factor. I see. Well, actually there are no levels because yeah. real law is only one. Right. But if you're assuming this, you can also assume that. Right. That's the and Swamiji, so, just, uh, so the sukshma sharira versus thula sharira, sukshma is more subtle and it's, is it more long-lived? And you, we could, could apply the same paradigm to sukshma sharira and thula Absolutely. Sharira. Yeah. I mean, software always outlasts the hardware, <laughs> right? So that which is sukshma lives longer than it. And that's why in every life, we get a different body, a sthula sharira. But the sukshma sharira, the mind that we have, is not different in every, every life. So the mind that we have is, is a pretty long living entity. Uh, yeah, and because it is sukshma, it lives for a longer time. Yeah. But it's still material, therefore it will be destroyed at some point. Yes, anything else? Yeah. I mean, there's some questions online. There's a, a question. What gives us the impetus to act? Is it the subtle body or the causal body? What is the? What gives us the impetus to do actions? Impetus to action. Well, it's from the subtle body, clearly, because the mind and the, in, in the buddhi are both there. Yes, the subtle. Another question. 
So Vasana's desires, can they be destroyed through pure knowledge from constant Shravana, Manana, and Nididhyasana? Yes. The Vasanas emerge from the mental impressions. And mental impressions are a part of the mind, obviously. And mind is a product of ignorance. So when knowledge comes, ignorance is destroyed along with all of its products, along with all of its babies. So the mind, the body, and this whole universe are really the children of ignorance. So you just, it's like ignorance is the root and this whole universe is like trees and branches. So if you want to cut the tree, if you just cut it somewhere else, it can sprout up again. But if you take it away from the roots, then it will never be sprout, sprout again. So that's the idea. Yeah. And another question is, what is the relationship between Maya and Shakti? Well, Maya itself is the power of the Lord. So they are one and the same. Another question is, can you please repeat why Maya does not have parts? Are, are, are gunas not part of Maya? They are very much a part of Maya. That's why he said Maya's attributes, the gunas are well known. Yes, absolutely. So because the material universe emerges from Maya and gunas are the essential attributes of everything that is material. Yeah. And is waking, dream and deep sleep states of the mind or states of Atman? Oh, there is no, Atman has no states. So... Yes. And so, Amdi, there's some questions from last week. Okay. Let's... So, so last week was... Um, many of them refer to verse number 107. Hmm. The first one is, I'm finding it a bit confusing that deep sleep is connected to bliss. But Could you come closer to them? I can't sorry. hear you. Well that? It says, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling, finding it a bit confusing that deep sleep is connected to bliss, but at the same time governed by tamas, which does not have a positive connotation? Uh, no, we do say ignorance is bliss. So tamas can be blissful, yeah. yeah. Another question. Knowing that, deep, that the deep sleep state brings more joy and happiness, how can one increase the experience of deep sleep? What controls the deep sleep state? Our, uh, yeah, good question. Our, our karma controls our deep sleep. We cannot, I mean, you know, deep sleep is, it, you feel free, you feel happy, and you cannot, you, you cannot control it. Um, so whatever experience of a little bit of freedom and bliss that you get in deep sleep, as long as you have earned that through your karma, karma will allow you to sleep well. When you have had your quota for the day of your bliss in the deep sleep, the karma wakes you up in the morning and says, okay, now time for some more pain and suffering. Enough of it. You, after a few more hours, we'll give you a little bit of deep sleep again. It's completely governed by karma. We can, that's why we cannot... I mean, think about it this way, not just deep sleep. Even if, let's say, you, have a, a, you are on a vacation, you don't have to go anywhere next day. You say, I'm not going to put an alarm, I'm just going to sleep. You cannot sleep indefinitely. Even if you, you will wake up sometime or the other. And the reason what wakes us up is our karma. That's what they say. Yeah. So the last question from last week, which was referring to verse 107, I understand that there is a direct experience in deep sleep. But does it mean... But what does it mean when we say there is tradition and inference in deep sleep? Did I misunderstand? Are we referring to samadhi here? Mm. Oh yeah, I mean, tr tradition, tradition really means what we have heard from the wise ones of the what happens in deep sleep. And inference means 
just the experience that there is no material world outside. There is no, we don't see the world. We don't see any objective universe. So the absence of objects, which generally trigger responses of likes and dislikes and prejudices and biases, all of those natural responses are absent because the objective world is absent and which is why we experience bliss. So we are able to infer the cause of the bliss by analyzing it this way. That is what it meant by inference. Yeah. There are maybe two last questions from this week. Okay, yeah. So one of them is, doesn't Maya begin with birth? Does it exist or not exist without the gross and subtle bodies? The subtle body is always there. In fact, Maya, that's why Maya is called beginningless. Maya doesn't begin with birth. Birth simply means an additional layer is got. That's all. So Maya is always there. The subtle body is always there. And that's why we will keep on being born again and again until we are able to destroy Maya. In which case the subtle body goes away. If the subtle body destroyed, all the karma is destroyed. If karma is destroyed, then there is no reason to be born again. So the, and that's why we need to be more vigilant about our minds. Yes, of course, we have to take care of our body. And, and, and most of us try to do the best we can. But all said and done, the body is still more perishable. All said and done, body will one day or the other go away. We have to take care of it. But we have to take more care of the mind because the mind is going to be around for a much longer time. We cannot change the mind at will the way the body automatically, naturally will change. It's a little bit like you, when you have a car, of course you have to take good care of the car. But it's not just the external appearance of the car. You have to be mindful of the quality of the engine. Make sure that everything is working properly because if something is wrong with the body of the car, it's l relatively easy to fix it. You can even get a new body put on it. But the engine, that's like the heart of the car. So the, our engine is really the mind and therefore we have to be extra careful about the, the, of the care that the mind requires. Yeah. So I the last question is, Outside my body and mind, is it that this whole world which I experience is Maya? Say that again. Outside my body and mind, uh. is it that this whole world that I experience is Maya? Not just outside the body and mind. The body and mind are also a part of the Maya. Yeah. All right. So you, good, good that these, okay, come on, yeah. So the uh, question is regarding how important is logical reasoning and intellectual resolution in uh, a person who is on his or her spiritual journey? Because every time uh, you try to intellectually resolve something, for a moment it looks like uh, the issue is gone, but again uh, after you uh, wake yep. up, uh, a new set of problem arises and it feels as though everything that you have done in the past is negated by this. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. The, the intellectually understanding the problem and solving one's doubts is helpful, certainly. But it has its limitations because there's always going to be new questions, new doubts. And so ultimately, I mean, you see, all intellectual activity occurs at a cerebral level. That does not necessarily bring about a change of consciousness. And so somehow we need to find a way, even if there is greater intellectual clarity, somehow to bring that clarity and understanding deep down here so that it informs the way I think, the way I work, the way I have my relationships, 
the way I understand my role in the world, unless that happens, my life will, I'll be the, still the same person. Maybe I can speak more impressively. Maybe I might write books, get a PhD, um, but it won't change me as a person. And therefore, while intellectual pursuits are great, they are helpful, but they have their limitations. Okay, last one. And if don't make it a big question, short one. Yeah, I'll try. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so, so what do you have um, to um, to tell the philosophers um, who uh, who say that mind is basically an epiphenomenon of the brain? I mean, basically, it's a brain which produces mind. So, what? so, so, what do you have to tell the philosophers? Uh, or like, um, would you have to educate them about uh, those who believe that mind is basically a phenomenon which comes out of the brain? It's basically like a oh, physics phenomenon. Brain, you mean? I don't have to tell anything to them. I mean, I just say, well, if you don't believe in a brain, then find some other way of to understand your experiences. And if they are happy with that alternative explanation, great. I mean, I, I don't think it, I don't, I don't want to speak about the mind as some kind of a dogma which everyone has to experience. What I find is this, this, this is essentially a kind of a, a structure that is presented here. And if this might help us understand our experiences in the world, help us understand ourselves and find a way to get out of the mess. If someone has a different way of understanding it without involving the mind or you know they kind of have their own theories about it and if they find it satisfying and fulfilling to them great i don't i, I don't think it's my job to correct them or anything yeah that's thank how you. i look at it yeah thank you yeah okay so thank you and we will continue next week with verse number one 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 that we will start next wednesday om jananim saratam devim ramakrishnam jagat gurum padapadme tayo shritva pranamami mohur mohoho For the satsang on Sunday, our subject will be not this time again. And next Wednesday, we will continue with the dealing with Maya. And on Saturday, our meditation will be at 6 o'clock as usual. So let's conclude with the prayer now. May the Divine Being, who is the Father in Heaven of the Christians, Holy One of the Jewish Faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, Auramasta of the Zoroastrians, the Great Spirit of the Native Americans, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May we be granted strength, freedom, and clear understanding. May we learn to see God in our own hearts and in everyone around us. May God bless us all and fill our hearts with gratitude, grace, and love. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace be unto all.